Hello Frederick, how are you today? Very good. It's been a while since OPEC played in Australia. How excited is the band coming to the land down under after a couple of years? It's always a treat because um, they always enjoy playing show shows um, down under because um, the crowd is very energetic and we always felt, well I haven't been in the band since day one but I've been uh, close to 10 years now and I've been in Australia quite a few times now. And the support is always great, you know, and we have we have really, we play really fun shows there, a lot of good memories, so. And this time around we get to play the Opera House and that's just amazing, so. Mm. The, the only thing that sucks is, of course, the travel. <laughs> but everybody knows that, right? Yeah, it is a long way from Sweden to Australia, that's for sure. Uh, and this time around we start off in New Zealand, so it's going to be even longer, actually. Uh, I've never been there before, so I'm looking forward to that as well. Oh, yeah. I think um, um, your music would actually uh, suit the the land of New Zealand as well. Um, yeah, Lord of the Rings uh, <laughs> kind of stuff. Exactly. Um, you, you've toured Europe and North America last year in, in support of Sorcerers. How have the fans responded to new material live? Very good, I think. It seems like... Um, Comparing to the previous albums, I think the new material is sunk in quick, but we choose songs as well that we released as lyrical videos before the album came out. Mm. And that seemed to work, because when we played the first show, the album wasn't even out, but they recognized the songs, and I was a bit amazed, actually, by the reaction of the new stuff <clears throat> when we played Sorceress and the Wildflowers. Uh, it really comes across good live, like good live tracks, and for us as well to play and play new stuff is exciting. Uh, it feels a bit refreshing. It, it blends in well with the with the older material as well. I think, even though we, we play a lot of the really heavy stuff and uh, mixes up with the new stuff pretty good. It gives it uh, one thing feeds off the other in a way. Yeah, um, and you've always been known to sort of balance your sets between the old music and the new music. Um, but this is easily the heaviest album Opeth has made since departing from their, from your death metal roots. Um, you know, like uh, uh, Crystallis is a prime example of this. Um, yeah. Per personally, what what was the source of inspiration in writing some of these heavy parts? I think all the. Um well, we listen to a lot of like late 70s, early 80s type of classic hard rock metal. Um, the particular song Chrysalis was in a way, I would say, a bit inspired by bands like Uriah Heep, maybe. A bit of an old Rainbow era, maybe, with Dio or stuff like that, but with a bit more aggression to it, you know more guitar driven. We, there was talk about before we did the album we wanted to have the drums louder and bigger sounding than the two previous album before and the guitars up a bit more and yeah we try to make heavier stuff you know but in a different way instead of going back and try to replicate the old stuff you know. Mm. Yeah. So I, I really enjoy that type of development you know. <clears throat> so this is very different inspirations for the album. Like the title track "Sorceress" is quite different for us. We we rarely tune down, but it's it's very down tuned. The, the low string on the guitar is tuned down to A, so it's it's basically a double A from the bottom to the top. Uh, the, the two bottom strings is just two A's with different octaves, which is kind of silly, but it it works. <laughs> yeah. mm. Uh, and that's kind of straightforward type of song. I, and I think this, that type of song in Chrysalis and also this track Era is very different if being open to tracks if you look in the back mirror. Yeah, I, I think they're like um, the meat and potato songs of the album. <laughs> and also the track Wildflowers is uh, one of the more heavier tracks as well. Yeah. Um, and we got a co-wrote on one track, me and Michael as well, in this one, the the song "Strange Brew." Yes. Which uh, was a different idea from the beginning, more like a evil version of "Days to Confuse" with Zeppelin, and then we started to throw this around with it, and it turned out this way, and has this kind of blues bluesy part in the middle, 
bit of Peter Green uh, type of stuff with Trade of Souls with me, Mike, and that was also kind of fresh to do something like that, I felt, for this album. Yeah, um, that track also reminds me a little bit of Mahavishnu Orchestra as well, that sort of jazz fusion. Um, oh, yeah, especially with that psycho keyboard part coming in after the first kind of call bit. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, actually, I have a question related to Strange Brew. Uh, as a lead guitar player, you have written some of the best leads in Opeth's career. Um, and with the track Strange Brew being one such example where you're shredding and impressing guitar work kicks the listener in the teeth with a, with a full-on slaughter metallic bliss, what challenges, oh, <laughs> what challenges do you face on this record? I try to... Uh, thank you very much for that, but... Um... I think one, Michael wanted me to let loose a little bit more on this album. He gave me more, like, may, maybe I've been slightly careful before, in a way. Some songs, but um, like in the song Wildflowers, for instance, he wanted me to do a solo that's just, that sounds very angry, you know. Um, yeah. Also, I kind of, if I'm talking guitar nerd language, I kind of started using the technique I haven't used before, like playing this pentatonic stuff. It sounds really fast, but it's like this type of economy picking. Um, I think a lot of players, when you wonder what, what the hell is these guys doing, you know, but it's, it's kind of a thing you need to be relaxed in the wrist, and it sounds like you're picking every note, and it sounds just very fast and furious, but it's to break it down if I play between the D string and the G string is like um, down, down, up kind of technique. Uh, mm. Some type of technique I was messing around with a lot in the 90s and then I had this idea you have to pick everything, uh, alternate picking or legato, but you can actually do stuff with this technique that's impossible to do yeah. if you have to pick every note. So I was digging into those kind of things when it comes to the technical aspect of it. Mm, that's interesting. I, I think the most unexpected direction the album takes is with the Seventh Sojourn, um, which is most, mm. which is mostly instrumental, like the main instruments being guest strings which go into a purely Middle Eastern theme direction. Tell us about the songwriting process of this song. That one Michael wrote totally on his own. Um, I met up with him and I learned the song because I always I have a feel I have to know every note on the album before we go in. It just feels right. Uh, so we jammed on it a few times, and luckily enough, we got Will Malone to do record the strings for it. And he worked with um, Black Sabbath quite a lot back in the day. He worked on the Sabbath Blood, the Sabbath album, and also Sabotage. Right. And he was actually the producer for the first Iron Maiden album as well. Okay. And he's done strings for a lot of people from. Lisa Stansfield to Depeche Mode and uh, Coldplay, I think. And, but he, he definitely has a history within the classic uh, metal stuff with the Sabbath and all that. So it was really cool to have him on him board for the to record real strings that he did. But he, Michael wrote the string section for that song, and but he didn't change it up anything. He he thought it was well written, so credit to him there. I think that track is kind of divides the album like a track in between the second half in a way but it's very different and yeah maybe we'll play it sometime uh, yeah I, I could imagine that would sound great live but then you need to bring out all the acoustics so you can't really do that now we for the acoustic sound these days we use the these piezo pickups um, so you have two chords out of the guitar which is really convenient for us and it sounds really good. I think it has improved our live sound quite a lot, especially with the old songs going from heavy metal riff to uh, acoustic finger picking part. Uh, on the fly, you can get really get those kind of um, dynamics we're looking for. But to play a song like that only on the P8, so with electric guitar, it would be, you have to have like the real deal. <laughs> yeah, and an orchestra as well, I would imagine. Yeah, that would be something. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there are some old Opeth fans who are still sore over the stylistic change 
Um, it, it more or less went from folky death metal to a, a Yethro Toll type of sound. Now I'm not, not going to ask you to bring back the, the death metal sound and, and the growls. I'm sure you're tired of discussing it, but I'll ask if uh, the change was an intentional choice or did the writing just happen that way? I think it was a bit of both. I, I believe Michael, who is the pilot of the band and main songwriter, always been like that. He felt uh, during um, the Watershed album that he kind of took the extreme metal thing to its peak and uh, the band needed to do something different, otherwise it would stagnate and maybe not, we wouldn't be around anymore, actually. Uh, we still we're still metalheads you know we listen to a lot of metal and we love heavy metal and we love to play the old stuff as well uh, it's not that we think shy away from it in some kind of stupid fancy way uh, if you go see us live you, you definitely get your dose of that chunk of the band's history you know uh, being that said I, you don't know what's going to happen in the future either you know uh we always say that when we've done a new album. <laughs> but um, well, well pers personally, yeah. I I, I, uh, I applaud your um, um, bold step to go into that direction, and I think um, it's great to hear that sort of um, progression in in rock music again, um, especially as talented musicians as yourselves. Um, and, and my follow-up question is: um, after twelve albums spanning over twenty years. What would you say are your favorite and least favorite Opeth albums, respectively? Oh, I kind of like them all, actually. I, one of my favorites now these days, since I had to dig into it a bit more, is actually the Deliverance album, apart from the stuff I've played on. Um, it has a lot of cool stuff, and now when we play this extra long set uh, in the op at the Opera House, we're playing a song called By the Pain I Seen Others with a song open never played live before and it just has a lot of really aggressive moments. It's quite demanding to play. A lot of switches between acoustic picking riffs to other riffs and stuff like that. So mm. I think Deliverance has a lot a lot of really great songs. For me it's one of the and I'm also very happy about the new remix of it. Um Least favorite? Oh, that's a tricky one. <laughs> yeah, I think they're all. Um, I kind of like them all. I, I, I think some albums are harder to digest. Like the second album is more difficult to soak in, but it demands to. Uh, well, then again, a lot of albums demands a lot of listening, so, which we kind of. It's a big thing for Opeth, I believe. That you shouldn't like the album immediately. Usually, those albums that takes a few listens is the one that last a bit longer to your attention span but um, yeah I really don't want to pick a least favorite but uh, well I wouldn't know <laughs> yeah um, well that's, that's fair enough um, I, I mean has Opeth um, discussed about playing any of, of the earlier records like um, Era Before Deliver Deliverance was released um, for example in its entirety um, because you're celebrating the 20th anniversary um, and, and 25th anniversary sometime in the future. Yeah, we haven't... Last time we did something like that was Ghost Reveries album. Uh, it's been talk about Still Life, which is a, a big album for, for Opeth, and we already done Blackwater Park in its entirety. And now we're kind of doing a compilation of um, Damnation and Deliverance, so... I reckon next time up, if we're going to do something like that, would be Still Life. Mm. Uh, which is a quite demanding album to play. I think I play almost all the songs on it. But it's a very complex album, I think. Uh, we, we're going to play a song from it now on this tour in Australia. But one song that always somebody's screaming for is um, Black Rose Immortal. Oh, yes. which is 22 minutes long and uh, we as, we've been talking about that so one of these days we're just going to have to play that song even though it's going to suck up a big chunk of the set list <laughs> that's probably why we won't play it yeah because <laughs> but it, it would be really fun to play one of the earlier albums like the first or something like that as well 
it's kind of sounded slightly different from back then to now as well so these older songs come to new life in a way as well it's different people playing on them I'm not saying it's going to be bad or anything but it's slightly different how people hit the drums or whatever you know mm. yeah I mean I think um, definitely um, the early fans of Opeth would um, much um, appreciate to hear some of those older songs played live too yeah I think we haven't played much of the really early stuff we're playing some stuff now like Demon of the Fall and stuff like that but uh, maybe next time around we should do like play a bit more from that era mm. why not um, it's difficult for us you know since it's 12 albums and you, and you want to promote the latest one play two or three songs out of that and so the old, a lot of the older stuff have really long songs you know so it's always a challenge to pick out the set list sure yeah I mean with the digital age being what it is like um, there are both pros and cons to how accessible music has become um, while you can discover a ton of new bands sitting at home in your underwear, it's also so easy to create a band and market your stuff that the metal scene has become oversaturated. Um, and it's often hard to sift through the, the rip-offs to find something original. Um, based on that, what do you think lies in the future of metal? Yeah, you're right. It's it must be tough being a new band, you know. But still, there are bands coming up. Um, I think if, if if you have something genuine and stick to it, uh, eventually it will pay off. I would say. Uh, not like listening too much what everybody else is doing, trying to copy others. If you feel you have something going, it's the maintain that and eventually it's going to come across I believe mm. but the future for metal uh, I mean it's metal is big but it's a lot of bands you know a lot of bands I don't keep track of uh, mainly I listen to new releases but it's mainly like the classic bands like listen to New Vade and New Testament and stuff like that it, now these days, I'm I'm mainly listening. If I listen to metal, I'm mainly listening to Coroner. Actually, the, the album Mental Vortex is high up on my playlist right now. Right, I love that album. It's great. Uh, is there any um, uh, is there any metal or prog bands from um, Australia that you've listened to before? We're going to tour with Caligo's Horse this time again, and uh, I remember we we played. A couple of shows or one or two last time I believe I believe we played with them in Brisbane I might be wrong sorry if I'm wrong <laughs> but they were really interesting you know so that's that's a good time when you notice other bands especially in Australia when you um, you have a bands you haven't heard about before and you get to see them live then you can really tell the quality of a band um, my last question is like um, uh, you know, speaking of um, great progressive metal bands, you're doing a short US tour with Gojira in a few months. Uh, is this tour lineup planned in Europe as well? No, it's only for a two week tour in the States. It's mainly we're going to do a couple of festival dates. Actually, it was going to be longer, but we didn't want to be away for longer than two weeks this time around since we already did five weeks in the States. But um, there was something that was brought up from our management. Me personally, I, I like Kojira. I, I bought. I haven't bought their latest one. I haven't checked that out yet. But I listen to them quite a lot, and I think they're an interesting, uh, relatively new band. First time I bumped into them was when I was playing with Arch Enemy. They did their first album. They were opening up for us in Spain, I believe. Oh, okay. And by then. I noticed uh, they had some cool stuff, you know, some originality. So that's a good package. It's we're, our music is very different, but um, they're great musicians, and it's gonna it's gonna be a good bill. And also Devin Townsend's project is gonna be on that tour. All oh, right. Well, that that um, that's, so that's that sounds like a, um, a very good lineup. Yeah. Well, I think we like to tour with bands that are a bit different from ourselves. Last time we toured in America, we toured with The Sword and 
12 of the, which is more of a stoner rock kind of band. Mm. So um, it's, I think it's good for the cr crowd to have bands that vary. If you, if it's a kind of package tour, several bands, it's nice to have the variation of different bands. Yeah, definitely. Well, um, thank you so much for talking to me today, Frederick. My pleasure, totally. All right, it, was, it was a pleasure. All right, have a good day, and thank you. Thank you, you too.